my special guest today served in the government of Zimbabwe as Minister of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare, and as Minister of Youth Development, Indigenization and Economic Empowerment. He's currently a PhD candidate in the Witz Business School in Johannesburg in South Africa. Mr. Patrick, welcome. Thank you very much, my brother. How are you? And uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to, to engage with you. Wonderful. I'm doing very great. I'm very happy to have you on this show. Um, and I can relate with what it's like to be a PhD candidate. How is the work going for you so far? <laughs> no, the work is, uh, is interesting. I'm, uh, I'm deep, deep in data collection. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's progressing well. Mm -hmm. It's progressing well. That is wonderful. I would really want to know from you, uh, firstly, you know, many people in and outside Zimbabwe have said and written a lot about President Robert Mugabe, uh, both the good and the bad. And as a person who did not only work with President Robert Mugabe, but had a personal relationship with him, what kind of a person was he and what did you like the most about him? I, th I think two, two, two things first before I, uh, I, 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 I answer that question. Um, a lot of people can write and say whatever they want to say about President Mugabe. But I think the, your, your, your biggest source of information on President Robert Mugabe is himself. Um, there's a whole wealth of uh, information on what he said himself, what he wrote. Uh, so in a lot of instances, I think uh, I'm going to answer your question, but before I answer it, I think there's a lot of information first-hand information that is within the public domain. So a lot of people then write things, say things that are contrary and, uh, to what he himself would have articulated. And I think uh, as, as your audience listens to me, mm -hmm. I think they want to listen to me from the perspective of, of, of evaluating what I am saying against what President Mugabe himself said. Uh, and if they find that there is a disconnect between what President Mugabe said and what President Mugabe did, then they should take it from the horse's mouth, from President Mugabe's mouth. Now, uh, you've asked me what was he like to work with as a, as, as a person. Um, the one word that comes to mind is that he was extremely intelligent. And uh, because he was extremely intelligent, it was very, very difficult to to go to him without your story being clear and without your story being um, today and say there's something else different to him. Uh, three years later, uh, then he would, he, would, he would ask you why you have changed your position, whether you have changed your position. So you needed to be extremely honest with him. That was first. And then secondly, uh, I don't think he tolerated uh, cowards that well. Uh, you could uh, go to him with a position, and even if he disagreed with your position, he wanted you to articulate your position clearly and be able to say to him, this is what I believe, Your Excellency, mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I believe this. And, mm -hmm. and even when he disagreed with you, he wanted you to be very, very clear about why you disagreed with him, why you disagreed with him. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, having a very, very significant uh, a dis disagreement with government policy mm -hmm. soon after I was appointed as a deputy minister. I think it was 2006 or 2007 mm -hmm. when, uh, when the military launched Operation Maguta. Mm -hmm. And I and I basically said I disagreed with with that particular position of Operation Maguta uh, because it 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 um it did not go in tandem with uh, with with the statistics on maize production, which indicated that sixty five to seventy percent of maize production came from small scale farmers. But the military had, uh, had, had an objective of wanting to, to capture uh, food security. So, so Operation Maguta 
uh, in my view, uh, uh, even though I was a deputy minister and I was not involved as a cabinet minister in terms of um, in terms of policy making with him, and I even uh, went further and then morphed itself into command agriculture, which was uh, which then proved to be quite disastrous. So that's one example of where you know you were able to articulate yourself and be clear. Uh, another example is my is my is my hairstyle. <laughs> I want to know about that one. <laughs> uh, I think uh, at a personal level, President Mugabe did not like uh, people that were tardy and uh, mm -hmm. not smart. He looked at uh, dreadlocks uh, in a in an uncomplimentary manner, uh, and he was not very. He did not take kindly to dreadlocks as as as. As, as 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 a mode of um, of of appearance, but I I when I when I decided to have dreadlocks uh, in two thousand and four, uh, I made sure that uh, you know I I I wear my dreadlocks and I wear my dreadlocks in a very very neat and tidy way, and if and if I was going to be anywhere near him, I would put on a suit, <laughs> and therefore he's. <laughs> His justification for saying, ah, but and so on, uh -huh, uh -huh. Was, uh, was, was, was taken away. Mm -hmm. And I think to a certain extent, I think, uh, you know, respected my, my ability to express myself mm -hmm. and my courage to be able to. Mr. Joao, your, your appointment as a minister was criticized by some as an example of nepotism because of your relationship with President Robert Mugabe. Uh, to what extent did this affect the reception that you got during your early days and your long-term service in both the government and in the parties and appeal? I, I, I don't think that is true, actually, that it was criticized, my appointment was criticized. It is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that have then come on to criticize my appointment have only come on to criticize my appointment in the probably 10 or so years after I was appointed. And a lot of them have got no clue where I came from and where my first appointment within a public office came, came in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 I believe I was appointed for two reasons, to be Deputy Minister of Science and Technology in 2005. The first reason I was appointed was uh, was because I was the only computer systems engineer that was in parliament from ZANU PF. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, at the way President Mugabe made his appointments, he made his appointments based on your career and on your profession. Mm -hmm. Now, there was the new Ministry of Science and Development, which was charged with having to develop a new ICT policy. And I was eminently qualified to do that. I had a, I have a degree in computer systems engineering, which I got in nine, which I got in 1990, and uh, and this was 15 years after I graduated with my first degree in computer systems engineering. Mm -hmm. I also masters of business administration. Uh, so, from a from a technical point of view, I was eminently qualified. Uh, the Deputy Minister of Science and Technology Development. Uh, the person that then took over and became Minister of ICT after we developed the ICT policy was Nelson Chamisa mm -hmm. uh, to implement the policy that we developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nelson Chamisa, uh, from a technical point of view, is, does not come from the ICT industry. Mm -hmm. And yet he was appointed a Minister of, of uh, Information and Communication Technology. So if you then take away mm -hmm. my relationship to President Mugabe, and then if you take away mm -hmm. uh, which political party I was coming from, and mm -hmm. then you look at craft competence, mm -hmm. it is obvious that President Mugabe made the correct choice. That's mm -hmm. the first point. Mm -hmm. uh, then the second point is um, ZANU-PF uh, pre, pre the coup, had uh, from 2000 developed a program to try and bring young people back into ZANU-PF. Mm -hmm. You will mm -hmm. recall that the 2000 elections, uh, when, which, which, which ushered in the MDC into parliament, ushered in the MDC uh, under the, the banner of uh, young people. Uh, 
And Zanu PF was hit hard in, in, in 2000 by not having young people. And, and, it, and, and as, a, as a political party under the leadership of President Mugabe, uh, the Zanu PF then went out of its way to recruit young people. Now, um, what had happened is I'd, I'd become active in politics uh, in, in 2000, and, I'm sorry, 1995. After my mother had a stroke, I, members of my family, my, my, my brothers, we agreed that I was the one, because I was a business, uh, self employed, as it were. And my other brother, Leo, who comes from, uh, who is a much stronger political pedigree, having attended the House Conference in 1979, is one of the youngest delegates representing ZANU, in, uh, and therefore could not appear. Uh, firstly, he was a secretary for administration within, within the district, very close to Norton. Uh, I then became uh, chairman of the district. Uh, I was then elected as secretary for administration in the district coordinating committee. And in South Africa, I think they call those regions. Uh, and then in 1998, I, I went into the provincial executive, a secretary for economic affairs. Uh, and my deputy then, a secretary for economic affairs, was uh, Philip Chiango. He was deputy secretary for economic affairs. Uh, and in 1999, I had a conversation with the with retired Air Marshal uh, Tungabirai. I went to his farm. He actually asked me to come to his farm. And, and he basically said, Patrick, why are, what are you doing in the main wing? I was, a, I was a member of the province in the main wing. And he asked me to move over to the, to the youth league. And, I, and, I, and in, in, in 2002, I, I became a member of, I, I then moved across to the provincial executive of the National and West Youth League. And in 2003, I was elevated to the national executive of the youth uh, and uh, became the director for, for youth. So when we then came to the elections on, uh, in, in 2005, the, the whole game plan around ZANU-PF was to mm -hmm. recast ZANU-PF as a party that is friendly to young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, and, I was, and, and at that time, uh, I was uh, 30, I think I was 38 at that time. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to do that, I, I recognize that I was not as young as I would have liked uh, to, to cast ZANU-PF, mm -hmm. uh, to, to cast myself as a young person representing ZANU-PF. To be able to do that, I then decided that I was going to grow my dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. So the, the growth of my dreadlocks mm -hmm. was, uh, was a political, uh, <laughs> what's the word? <laughs> it was a political message. Yes, yeah, it was a political yeah. message mm -hmm. to, the, to the young people. Mm -hmm. And when I got elected into parliament, people saw my dreadlocks and assumed that I was young. I was younger than some of my colleagues, that include uh, Flora Booker, was younger than, who is younger than me. Sevia Kasukwere was younger than me. But I achieved in that particular political messaging of saying young people. And and as and as and, and as an executive of the of, of of the youth league, as a national executive of the youth league. We became quite strong and quite um, quite um, powerful, if we if 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 we can use the word, up until uh, certain members of the Politburo, especially those that came from the from the from the war veteran sector, uh, became quite uncomfortable with with at the time we called the Young Turks with the, with the Young Turks, uh, and uh, if if you Google. Uh, Young Turks and uh, ZANU PF raids in Young Turks. You will find an article from 2007, mm -hmm. which says that the Politburo states that the likes of Patrick Joao Sevier must no longer be in the. That represents me as an individual having a political constituency together with my other colleagues in the youth league uh, which 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 then de which then demystifies the myth that i was appointed on the basis of uh, of, uh, of, 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 of relationship of, with president mugabe 
for the basis of relationship with President Mugabe. Uh-huh. And, and, and you see this happening. Uh, and I think it was General Mujuru who moved that we must get out of the Youth League. Mm-hmm. And when we were then being forced out of the Youth League, we simply said, look, we hold a significant influence within all of the structures of uh, ZANU-PF. Mm-hmm. And we then went round to all of the executives, uh, provincial executives, uh, talking to our colleagues and explaining to our colleagues that it was now time for us to transition into the main wing. Mm-hmm. This, this is how we then transitioned in 2008, 2009. This is how the majority of the leadership in the youth league trans, trans. And this sea change in the demo is what Jonathan Moyo, professor, observed in about generation 40 in in August, quality of our political active PF as a party for young people. And this then manifested itself in 2013, when the 2013 election was won by ZANU-PF on the basis of the youth vote. And it then manifested itself even further in 2017, with the coup by the military and the war veterans who were worried about the resurgence of this uh, generation of young people that they call G40. So the myth to say that Patrick Joa was appointed because he's President Mugabe's nephew, it can be debunked from two perspectives, pedigree and mm-hmm. two, I mm-hmm. have the practical political pedigree. Mm-hmm. Which practical political pedigree got a whole military to come after after myself and a couple of my other colleagues? Mm-hmm. Uh, apart from factional battles within uh, the ZANU-PF, what, what were the main administrative challenges of being a cabinet minister in Zimbabwe? I became a cabinet minister in 2005, uh, 2015, sorry. Uh, I was a deputy minister in 2005. And, and one of the things that shocked me when I was that, uh, one of the principal directors within the ministry, within the civil service of the ministry, was a, was a serving military general. Now, uh, what has happened, what happened in Zimbabwe between 2013 and uh, up to now, is that the military has uh, then been placed into strategic positions within the civil service of, of, of the Zimbabwean government. And that then became something that is a, a major cause of concern. So you now, have, you now had uh, effectively a, a parallel system of govern, government that was then uh, happening. Where, where, where these uh, principal directors, and you will find that if you go to each and every ministry, there's a principal director who's a general or something or the other. Uh, you will find that there's this parallel system of government which is there. And that is uh, something that is really, really problematic in that, um, you know, when, 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 when these generals rise to the ranks that they are at, they've, they would have risen having gone through their lives taking orders and giving orders. And because they have a culture of giving orders, it becomes mm-hmm. very, very difficult to operate for, with them. For, for them to listen to somebody saying, to operate with them. But more mm-hmm. importantly, for them to listen to somebody saying, sorry, General, I don't agree because mm-hmm. this and this and that. Mm-hmm. That is the major problem. So, so you have a situation where, where you've got a, serving military officers who don't take instructions from the ministers. They don't take instructions from the civil service structure. They take instructions directly from, uh, from, defense, from defense House, from defense headquarters. Um, and and, and that, might, that, that problem is in, um, in, in all government departments and all government institutions, including within the judiciary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that becomes quite problematic. And and the most visible manifestation of 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 that infiltration within the institutions and structures of government was the 2018 presidential election, uh, where 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 the security establishment within Zimbabwe, after realizing by looking at the data that was on the on the server. After realizing that uh, uh, 
uh, Emerson Monangago was heading for a defeat, uh, was going to be the, the, the rightfully elected president of Zimbabwe. Uh, they then abandoned that particular server and then started um, uh, filling in uh, fake results uh, uh, using Excel. Uh, and that's 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 been highly and well well ventilated by uh, by Professor Jonathan Moyo in his book on Excel Gate, and and the source material for Professor Moyo's uh, book on Excel Gate, the major aspects in terms of the source material are one the Constitution of Zimbabwe, the Electoral Act, the regulations pertaining to elections, and the the ZEC manual, and then fifth and most importantly. Zek's own report on the conduct of the elections. This is where Professor Moyo sub puts his submission around Excel gate because the evidence mm -hmm. is quite significant. Now, the people that do this are the military. And I have a, and I have a, and I have a, and I have a deep understanding of why they do this. And I think all, a lot of it emanated from, um, from what happened uh, in the late 1990s as we were moving towards 2000 and the land reform program. Um, the, the, the issue that, uh, that Zimbabweans fought for in terms of independence were two things, getting the land back and uh, one man, one vote. Uh, uh, there was a statement which we used to go no independent before, before majority rule. Um, perspective uh, where the war veterans and uh, the military consider themselves uh, be stockholders is because they believe to the extent, extent they are even willing to suspend civil liberty, tempering with the uh, with uh, understand that they are no longer independence uh, now resides in the 2018 Zimbabwe constitution because factors which require a referendum for them to be amended, which is chapter four on the land and chapter, chapter 16 on the land. Little reasons for the liberal. And therefore the way forward really is to find a way in which the military can understand that tuition is a sacrosanct. The 2013 code developed by the people of Zimbabwe accepted, it was developed by the people of Zimbabwe under the leadership of President Mugabe uh, on the ZANU-PF site and Prime Minister Morgan Changirai uh, representing the various formations of the opposition as it was as, as, as the MDC. And that uh, challenge around the issues of civil governance uh, uh, manifests itself not only within all other uh, departments within government, but more importantly and more insidiously within the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. And the conversation really should be, the military should step away from pretending to be the custodian of uh, the liberation struggle and give it to the people of Zimbabwe who fought either through Kumikira, either through giving up their sons and daughters, uh, but they contributed, the people of Zimbabwe contributed to the independence of Zimbabwe and articulated themselves in how independent Zimbabwe should be governed. Mm. It is argued that uh, you were part of the Generation 40 faction of ZANU-PF that was dismantled after 2017, after the military coup uh, that deposed President Mugabe. Did this faction ever exist as a substantive and distinguishable group within ZANU-PF itself, or it was a political label used to discredit some members of the party, as you earlier said? It, is a, it was a political label, and it still remains a political label. As recently as, uh, I think it was two days ago or a day ago, mm -hmm. uh, the, this uh, institution or this entity, this animal that is calling itself ZANU-PF, is still calling people G40. Mm -hmm. It was just a way of, uh, of labeling people that did not agree with the with the reality mm -hmm. that the governance of Zimbabwe must be intergenerational, it is as simple as that. And 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 unfortunately, 
uh, when uh, the 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 that va that validated the coup and led the coup uh, support, as it were, with the MDC. They are, the, they are the ones that are responsible for uh, the transition of Zimbabwe. In, um, and it was it was nothing about a, a faction. I never met and sat, even though I'm called a G40 kingpin, I never met and sat with anybody to talk about a faction. Uh, and I, I, I actually, when I used to write uh, articles in the Sunday Mail, I used to write against factionalism. And one of the very first articles that I wrote uh, when I was talking about factions and factionalism, and I think it was in September, August or September 2014, I made reference to a conversation that I had with a senior member of um, the party who was saying to me that there's nothing wrong with factions. And I want to be to say state clearly now that that particular individual was none other than Emerson Munangago. I gave him my article to say, ah, chef, can you please have a look at this article mm -hmm. and tell me what you think? He says, ah, but Nesho, uh, my factions are necessary. That was ridiculous. I found it totally ridiculous. And I wrote that I found it ridiculous that a senior member would say that. Mm -hmm. And he knows, because this was a conversation that he had with me, he knows I was talking about it. Mm -hmm. at, at what point and why did your relationship with the current president, Emerson Mnangagwa, and his allies grew apart? Uh, I, around 2003 or 2000, yeah, I think it was around 2003, when he was part of that, um, that arrangement to, to effect a military coup. Uh, with the with the support and help of the British, so the British have the British have always had Emerson Mnangagwa as their stooge and as their puppet, and uh, this is what they did uh, in 2017. They tried to do it and they sought the the assistance of South Africa. And President Becky rebuffed them, uh, and they even tried to buy out President Mugabe by saying that they would give President Mugabe 10 million US dollars, and President Mugabe said no, you would not sell out his country. But uh, when Emerson Mnangagwa was then working. Uh, with the like with uh, uh, with with the British to try and uh, a, a, a defect a coup, which 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 he failed to do. That's when I lost all semblance of uh, of respect for him because he would by by day claim to be loyal to President Mugabe, and yet by night surreptitiously he would be plotting to overthrow President Mugabe using undemocratic means. And uh, you will see you you and you saw it um, when we went to the 2004 uh, Congress, uh, which ushered in uh, Maim Juru as, uh, as 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 Vice President. I, I I actively participated within my province to to thwart the ambitions of uh, Emerson Munangagwa, uh, and he knows that. Um, mm -hmm. When he, yeah, when he was working with the likes of Patrick Chinamasa, Anana July Moyo, and so on. People tend to ask, uh, what is it that you achieved in government? I, th mm -hmm. I think the one thing that I will know that I managed to achieve, which is still standing, mm -hmm. is that I established uh, a youth bank. It was the work that I did because I came from the youth and I knew these were the aspirations of the youth. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. is still surviving and it mm -hmm. is still thriving as a bank. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for giving me. Listeners, uh, this was Mr. Patrick Juau. He served in the government of Zimbabwe as Minister of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare and as Minister of Youth Development, Indigenization and Economic Empowerment. He is currently a PhD candidate in the WITS Business School in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mr. Juau, thank you so much for the time. Pleasure, my brother.